Hello, and welcome to episode 16 of Arbiter of Worlds. If you're a returning subscriber, thanks for supporting the channel. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Here at Arbiter of Worlds, we study the art and science of running and creating tabletop role-playing games. Let's get into it. Today, we're going to discuss the problem of the quadratic wizard and the linear fighter. Quadratic wizard and linear fighter. It's a conundrum that's become a meme. A first level fighter and a first level wizard start out as peers, but over time, the wizard's power grows quadratically as he gets more spells of higher levels, while the fighter's power grows only linearly. It's an issue for almost every D20 fantasy game today, and it's a problem that's been around for so long that people think it's inevitable. Of course wizards are quadratic and fighters are linear, man. That's just how things are. But that's not true at all. In the earliest iterations of Dungeons & Dragons, using the combat rules from Chainmail, fighting men packed real punch, while magic users were sharply delimited. In Chainmail, fighters got to make one attack per level against enemy troops. So consider what was called a superhero, an ace level fighting man with plate mail and magic sword. That hero counted as armored foot in Chainmail. And let's say he was fighting hobgoblins, which defended his heavy foot. The hero would attack by rolling nine six-sided dice, eight dice for being a superhero, plus one die for the sword, and he'd score a hit on every five or six rolled. And so we'd expect to see him kill three hobgoblins every round. So in original Dungeons & Dragons, using Chainmail, an eighth level fighter averaged 30 hobgoblin kills in 10 rounds. Now let's compare the same fighter in basic Dungeons & Dragons, the beloved BX. As an 8th level fighter, we'll assume he has a plus 1 sword, he has a strength of 16, and we'll go ahead and use the variable weapon damage so that his weapon does 1 die 8 damage. The fighter will need to roll a 6 or higher on 1d20 to hit the Hobgoblin's AC, so that's a 75% chance. And he'll inflict 1d8 plus 3 damage against the Hobgoblin's average hit points of 6, so he'll need to roll at least a 3 on his damage die. So again, that's a 75% likelihood. So with a 75% chance of hitting, a 75% chance of killing if he hits, the 8th level fighter will kill an average of 0.56 hobgoblins per round. That's less than one-fifth what he could do, just one rules addition earlier. At most, he'll kill one per round. So in BX, an 8th level fighter averages 5 hobgoblins per 10 rounds. It's a dramatic reduction in power, and it's a very sad state for a so-called superhero. Now, what if the fighter was using the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons rule set? As an 8th level fighter with a sword plus 1 and the strength of 16, he'd actually need to roll an 8 plus on a d20 to hit the Hobgoblin, giving him only a 65% chance to hit. He's actually worse off because AD&D eliminated the attack bonus from strength 16. To match a basic fighter, an AD&D fighter had to have a strength of 1851. And if the fighter hits, he'll do 1d8 plus 2 damage, Again, against the Hobgoblin's average hit points of 6, so he'll need to roll at least a 4 on his damage die for a 62.5% likelihood. So now our AD&D fighter is 65% chance to hit, 62% chance to kill, so only about a 40% chance of killing a Hobgoblin each round. However, fighters in AD&D do get multiple attacks. An 8th level fighter attacks 3 times every 2 rounds. You factor that in. And our AD&D fighter averages around 6 hobgoblins per 10 rounds. He's slightly better than BX, but he's still a weakling compared to Chainmail and OD&D. And then worse, over the intervening decade, the fighter's rival, the magic user or the wizard, has gotten more powerful. How so? First off, magic users in the original Dungeons & Dragons had to call out the range of their fireballs and lightning bolts, as in tabletop wargame catapults. Opponents who saved against those attacks took no damage whatsoever. Now these spells automatically hit, and the damage is at best halved by a saving throw. So in the decade between the release of original Dungeons & Dragons and the release of basic and advanced Dungeons & Dragons, the fighters got massively nerfed while the magic users got massively strengthened. And that's the origin of the quadratic wizard linear fighter problem. It isn't inevitable. It didn't start with third edition the way some people think. It started with design decisions that were made in basic and advanced D&D. And about 90% of the old school renaissance is playing some variant of advanced or basic D&D, which means that virtually all of them are playing with fighters that suck. Now, would it be any better if they were using a more recent rule set? 
the designers of D&D 3rd Edition actually thought they had solved the problem of linear fighters and quadratic wizards. In retrospect, it sounds absurd because the problem actually got worse during the 3.5 era. But if you go back and look at the playtest reports from the release of 3rd Edition, initially everyone thought 3rd Edition fighters were OP. Why was that? Well, on paper, the 3rd edition version of an 8th level fighter with a plus 1 sword and a strength of 16, he seems much more powerful than his predecessors. His attack bonus improves every level instead of every few levels. His strength now grants a plus 3 bonus to hit and damage, which is much better than AD&D and even better than in BX. And he gets feats. And let's assume he's built to kill guys like Hobgoblin. So he's taken greater weapon focus and cleave. He has two attacks per round with an attack bonus of plus 14 on his first attack, plus 9 on his second attack, and he'll deal 1d8 plus 6 damage with each hit. The Hobgoblins have AC 15 and 6 hit points. So he has a 95% chance of killing a Hobgoblin on his first attack, after which he can cleave onto a second Hobgoblin at a 95% chance kill, and then finally make a second attack with a 70% kill rate. And so the third edition fighter now has a Hobgoblin kill rate of 0.95 plus 0.95 plus 0.7, or 2.6 Hobgoblins per round. And that's almost the same as Chainmail which is not coincidental. They were trying to fix the problem. And initially, playtesters thought they had fixed the problem. But then, while making those changes, 3rd edition made other changes that were subtle, but more impactful, specifically four rule changes. First, they eliminated the need for wizards to declare they were casting spells before rolling initiative. Two, they gave a concentration check for wizards to avoid having their ongoing spells disrupted by damage. Three, they gave bonus spells for high intelligence. And four, they added metamagic feats that allowed wizards to work around the inherent flaws in their spells. And so these four rule changes created a wizard class that was far, far, far more powerful than anything that had been seen in previous incarnations. And once people figured out how to play wizards in third edition, how to exploit the rule mechanics, they outshone fighters so badly that experienced players simply advise people, don't play fighters. And you had this whole tier system develop of evaluating class power based on how close they were to a full caster progression. Now, what about in 5th edition D&D? A lot of people think 5e has fixed the issues with 3e. And it's true for some issues, it has, but not this one. In 5e, the fighter actually gets worse again. Now, it's true, an 8th level fighter in 5e who started with 16 strength, now he gets to grow to 18 strength. He also gets to attack twice per round instead of once per round or three times per two rounds. He has an attack bonus of plus 8, and he deals 1d8 plus 5 damage. So on paper, he seems really strong. But all the gains that the 5th edition player's handbook gave to the fighter, the 5th edition monster manual took away. Hobgoblins now have AC 18 and 11 hit points. It means the fighter has only a 55% chance of hitting and only a 37.5% chance of killing. He kills an average of 0.2 hobgoblins per round per attack, or 0.4 hobgoblins per round total. So over 10 rounds, he'll kill four hobgoblins. So the 5e fighter actually sets a new record for being the worst fighter at killing hobgoblins. And, you know, the implications of this carry throughout the entire game. This is why 5e fights can be such slogs. When I created my own D20 fantasy game, Adventure Conquer King System, one of my chief priorities was to restore the fighter to his preeminence on the battlefield. If you want to imagine what I think a high-level fighter should be like, you should read about the legendary Achilles rampage through the battlefields of Troy in the Iliad. Or watch any Japanese samurai movie in which one man stands against ten. It is a symphony of slaughter. Right? It is a carnival of carnage. And that's the goal I had for Axe. But how does one simulate a symphony of slaughter on the tabletop? Well, here's the approach I developed. It consists of two mechanics. First, fighters get a damage bonus that increases with level. So at first, third, sixth, ninth, and twelfth level, they get plus one on their damage rolls. Second, every time a fighter kills an opponent, he can immediately advance five feet and attack again, up to a maximum number of times equal to his level. In other words, in Axe, every fighter has cleave, and not just one cleave, but many cleaves. Now, these rules are so subtle 
that countless people have read Acts and not understood their implications. They assume the game just runs like some version of D&D, but it doesn't. These two components interact. As your chance to hit and average damage now increase with level, your chances of landing a killing blow increase effectively twice as fast as in AD&D or BX. And since with every kill you get a chance to cleave, you have a geometric increase in killing power. We can illustrate this with our hobgoblin hypothetical. We put an axe eighth level fighter with strength 16 and a plus one sword up against hobgoblins with AC3. In Axe, he's going to need to roll a 5 plus to hit the Hobgoblin, so that's about an 80% hit rate. And as an 8th level fighter, he's got a plus 3 damage bonus on top of plus 1 from the sword and plus 2 from strength, so he deals 1d6 plus 6 damage on every hit. With a minimum damage of 7, he's going to kill a Hobgoblin on every hit. And that will allow him to attack again, up to 8 additional attacks per round. In general, if you do the math, he'll kill about 4 Hobgoblins per round, with the potential for up to 9 Hobgoblins in a round. So in Axe, you see an 8th level fighter killing 40 hobgoblins per 10 rounds, and possibly more. By the numbers, he's about uh, 33% better than the fighting man in Chainmail. He's about 800% better than the fighter in Basic D&D. And he's 1,000% better than the fighter in 5e. And that, in turn, becomes very important on the battlefield. Because in Axe, mass combat is very important. And I wanted a game where great heroes could influence the outcome of great battles with thousands of combatants. And because of how the game is designed, they actually can. So in Axe, you can finally be Achilles on the plains of Troy and turn the tide of mass battle. And of course, axes retain the old school limitations on spell casting. There's pre declaration of spells, there's disruption of casting. And so, casters are certainly fun, they're certainly powerful, they're still quadratic, but fighters are quadratic too, and they're both necessary and they're balanced on the battlefield. Now, obviously, this is just a shallow analysis of a very complex design problem. I haven't delved into the utility of various spells off the battlefield. I haven't looked at the endurance of the fighter relative to the alpha strike of the wizard and so on. But I think it serves to illustrate some key points that I want to leave you with. First, balance in a tabletop RPG is relative. If you strengthen class number one, but you dramatically strengthen class number two, you've actually nerfed class number one. If you strengthen class number one, but dramatically strengthen the monsters that class number one has to fight, you've actually nerfed class number one. Back when I used to do massively multiplayer game design consulting in the early 2000s, we called this a relative or comparative nerf. Third edition imposed a comparative nerf on fighters relative to wizards. Fifth edition imposed a comparative nerf on fighters relative to monsters. Second point, unbalanced or bad game outcomes are not an inevitability in tabletop RPGs. You do not need to settle for broken rules. The bad outcomes are always a product of game design choices. And if you trace the problem back to its source, you might find a way to fix it. Third, perhaps most important, game mechanics can have second and third order implications that are not immediately evident. The differences between axe combat and BX combat are so subtle that professional game reviewers have missed them. But in fact, they're radically different with an 800% mathematical difference in the expected outcome. So there's a butterfly effect that arises from game design choices that a lot of people just don't recognize. You change one tiny thing and you can change everything. Which is why the best game designers always work incrementally, making small changes and then thoroughly playtesting those changes before making further changes. That's all for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Before you go, please hit the like and subscribe button so that the YouTube algorithm gives me experience points for today's episode. And after that, I'll see you next week.